Hello. Hi, I'm Katie Gimbar. And I'm Dr. Laj McCammon, and we're so excited to be here today to share our ideas about how to transform education, making it into something relevant, exciting, engaging, and inspirational for our students. In order to accomplish this, we need a paradigm shift in classroom instruction, a shift that successfully prepares teachers for the current realities of the classroom, those realities being large class sizes filled with diverse learners. Katie has become a leader among teachers who are using a method called flipping the classroom with fizz, a method that is about shifting instruction using one-take videos like this video we're watching right here. We're so excited to have Katie here to share her story and talk about her transformation. To me, it's a story about how a math teacher became an artist and how she continues to inspire her students to become artists as well. So let's go ahead and bring out Katie and Dr. Lodge in real life, but let's not applaud for them or clap for them. Let's, let's do something a little different. Um, so uh, if everybody would make this, this noise for me or this, this tone for me, go, uh, great. Okay, so that means, that means stop. All right, and then we're going to have volume levels here. So when I do this, we get louder. When I do that, we get softer. So let's practice. Here we go. Uh, great, so let's do this. Welcome to the stage, Katie Gimbar and Dr. Lodge McCammon. Uh, All born artists. It's true. An artist is someone who looks at the world, takes in that information, processes it through their creative lens, and then creates artifacts or generates artifacts of that learning. We are all born with this incredibly creative capacity for doing this. This is my niece, Elizabeth. Elizabeth is almost five years old, and she is an amazing artist. She looks at the world, most of it for the first time, and uh, process it through her creative lens and then generates artifacts of her creative learning. Elizabeth, like most kids her age, she sings, she dances, and she draws her way through the world. And she's a very creative or divergent thinker, right? So like most little kids we know. If I give Elizabeth a pencil and say, Elizabeth, what can you do with this pencil? She'll look at me and she'll say, Uncle Lodge, I can turn this pencil into a rocket ship. And the ro I can put little people on the pencil in the rocket ship. And I can shoot the rocket ship into, the sp into space. And it's going to land on a planet. And then one of the little people gets off. And they paint that planet purple. And then it shoots to the next planet. And Uncle Lodge, of course, the next planet is blue. OK, okay so let me have the pencil back. Yeah. Um, I get it. Uh, uh, so if you hand the same pencil to a middle schooler and say, hey, what can you do with this pencil? They'll look down at the ground and say, take a test. It's a tragedy, what's happening. Uh, something is happening, and it's not a good thing. And I refuse to accept the fact that when Elizabeth grows up, when she gets old, and she's 11, right, um, that, that we, we tell her, the school system tells her, you know, that your creative process, your artistic process, no, no, we don't do that anymore. Singing and dancing and drawing your way through the world. No, no, you're 11. Grow up. We don't, we don't do that. You know what your job is now, Elizabeth? Sit, listen, and prepare for that test. It's a really dangerous thing that we're doing to kids. Um, which is why I created a project called Fizz. And this is the framework I use for the project Fizz. Uh, um, and it's supposed to uh, elevate the conversation about looking, being able to see the activities that are the most rigorous and relevant that we can do in the classroom that inspire students to maintain and, and, and hold on to that artistic process, that creative framework in their mind that, they, that we're all born with. So up the vertical axis, we have what's called Bloom's Revised Taxonomy, lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills. Along the horizontal, we have um, what's the name? Garner's Multiple Intelligences. Right. Garner's Multiple Intelligences. <laughs> Uh, the different learning styles. So what this framework really tells us is that the highest order thinking skill we can have students do is to create new products and ideas, which is like, okay, perfect. This is going to support that artistic mindset. 
We're having students take in information through their lens and generate products of that learning. Great, creating new things. Now, I think Bloom's revised taxonomy is incomplete. I think if we're having students create new products and ideas in the classroom, it's an obvious next rigorous step to have students publish those products and ideas, to share so they can reevaluate and reanalyze not only their work, but the work of their peers. And we can do this with simple one-take videos, which is what the FIS project is about. So what we want, based on this framework, is that every day in school, we want to engage students by having them create and publish their work and hitting as many learning styles as we can possibly hit. Kinesthetic learning, musical learning, collaborative learning. Now, we know this to be true. We, this is what we want. So Katie, I ask you, you are a teacher. Why isn't this happening in our schools, in our classrooms? What, what's, what's gone wrong here? Well, the bottom line is time. When you ask any teacher, we sit through professional development on a regular basis, and we get these great ideas that we want to take back to the classroom, and we want to use them. And we get back into the reality of our classrooms, and our answer is, when do we have time to do this? I have to pull my kids through this material. I have a curriculum to follow. And they don't know anything yet. They're all over the place with what they know. So this is what a typical day ends up looking like for me and other teachers. Te teaching a topic like systems of equations. I start off the day and I'm energized and I've got to take the kids through the definitions, the new vocabulary they need to know, and just the procedural aspect of the topic, working through examples. By fourth period, I'm doing the same thing again. Another hour long lecture, standing at the front of the room, just taking them through the information. Fifth period, yet another hour, and you can see the fatigue starting to set in because through all this lecture piece, I'm also managing behavior. I'm having to control middle school students and keep them in their chairs long enough to just get them through the information, just a little while longer, and you'll be able to start doing some work. Just wait, I've got to teach you this first. And then there's the eighth period. You're just utterly exhausted because you've realized you have repeated the same information for now four hours, and you're the only one that didn't need to hear it for four hours. So you're, you're leaving school exhausted and feeling very ineffective. I refer to this as the Great Depression of teaching. <laughs> this right here. Repeating yourself day in, day out, over the course of multiple years, and, and realizing, truly realizing that this is what you're doing. This is the reality of that lecture, of that we spend all our time right here. Speaking to one type of learner, the learner that can sit and listen, and then expecting them to do the lower, or, lower order thinking skills of remembering and understanding. And we repeat, and we repeat, and we repeat. It's mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausting. My name is Dr. Lodge McCammon from the Friday Institute in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm here to tell you there's a serious problem in American education. There's too much lecture in the classroom, which is not engaging for our students. Too much of the time, education today looks something like this. We have students in the classroom and we lecture to them, which is inefficient, not engaging, and a one-shot deal. Then we send them out of the classroom to apply their learning individually, which is also not engaging. I started a project called FIS that trains teachers to flip the classroom. That way, outside of the classroom, students are now watching FIS video lecture series created by their teachers in the style like what we're watching right now. I've got a camera and a tripod. I've got boards with some information that I can slide. This is an extremely efficient way of delivering information to these students. They can be viewed multiple times, and it creates classroom time. That way, in the classroom, we can focus on differentiated instruction, where the teacher is a facilitator of collaboration, applying, creating, and publishing exciting and engaging products of student learning. I broke down the information, decided what exactly they needed to know, put my information on the whiteboard you see, and used the little one-take video. No editing, upload it to the computer, and at the end, I looked at the timestamp. Four minutes and 33 seconds. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I been doing to my children and myself? If it takes an hour in class every day, multiple times, a day and multiple years, and it only took four minutes and 33 seconds here, how ineffective have I been in my practice? 
So it was a no-brainer for me, and this led me to record 93 video lectures. And you can see they're all in the same format. I'm on the video, I've got the whiteboard, it's very personal for my students. I'm using gesturing to draw their attention to the information, facial cues and bringing them in. It's like a front row seat for every one of my students. The average video is 10 to 11 minutes. And what I found was this was the most personal and engaging way to interact with my kids and the information. Now some of you may be looking at the screen and think, wow, that's a lot of math. 93 videos of math, that's a lot of math. Um, I don't look at it like that. I look at this screen and say, that's art. That's amazing. It's an artist. That someone who saw information, al Algebra 1 and 8th grade math, looked at that information, processed through her own creative lens, and generated these artifacts of her learning that just so happen to help kids learn math. Each one of these videos is very unique to her, to her art. No one has ever explained that, that, that topic the same way she did. It's very unique, and it's very personal and creative. Perhaps bigger than all of that is modeling. If we value creation over all other higher order thinking, then we must show our students what that looks like. Best practice in education is if you want your students to do something and do it well, then you should first model that for them. And that's what this process helped me to do, help to show them how I could use technology to take in information and then present that back. But it's very important to understand the bigger picture here. It's not about one take videos. It's not about me creating these video lectures. It's about removing the lecture from the classroom so that my class time can be more efficient and more effective. So that my classroom can actually look like this every day. And this is my classroom. There were days when it might have looked like this before flipping the classroom, but now every day can look like this, where there's collaboration in the upper right corner, where students that need to spend more time going through the material are working on problem sets and going through the material themselves, not listening to me talk. You can see other groups in the top right doing very different things. And they're each having their group work on targeted skills that they need to focus on. And the best part, this bottom group here where I felt like oh, I was doing the worst to them in the classroom when they were bored out of their mind listening to me talk because they got it and they were ready to do something they can now start creating something and publishing their work for themselves and for their peers. This is true differentiation. And this is perhaps one of my favorite pieces that Lodge discussed, creation. This is one of my students, Dakota. She is filming her own video lecture of exponential growth and decay. She had to take the information, break it down and decide what was important, what she needed to highlight in her video, and then she published this. How powerful for her learning that she now becomes the teacher. She gets to take it in and help present to her, her peers. And more importantly than that, she's become an artist. She's taken the information and she's put it through her lens and displayed that in her own unique way. It's set up similar to mine because I've modeled that process for her, but she's made it her own. Her classmate joins in as well. This is true creation. All of this can be done in classes as large as 37. And I'm sure if there's any teachers out there, you're probably cringing right now at what I just said, but my algebra classes are both sitting at 37 this year. And this is what I'm making happen. And that sounds, you know, a little scary, but for the past four years, my class sizes have been that size. And that is a problem that's not going away in education. We have larger classes. And I can honestly say, without flipping the classroom, I wouldn't be able to meet the individual needs of my students in classes that large. But with flipping the classroom, I'm now a facilitator of the learning. Students are doing differentiated assignments, they're publishing and they're creating, and they're going through the material where I'm able to actually get around and spend individual time with each of them. Not to mention the nightmare of trying to lecture to 37 eighth graders. Yeah, it's not fun. The entire time, I'm just trying to keep them engaged and, I mean, you're doing everything short of juggling. So this is a much more effective way to let the kids go through the material and be responsible for their own learning while you get to facilitate. That's great, um, but Katie, what, what about student achievement, right? And that's very important. And that's always the next question. It's no-brainer to me that my students perform better. 
the natural response is people say, oh, well, yeah, because they have the videos, they can always go back and look over it. It's like they have their teacher to remediate them at all times. But bigger than that, the shift that flipping the classroom creates is that your class time is now more effective and more efficient. So students aren't going home to apply the information. They're going through the information in class with their teacher every day. So they're spending more class time now going through the material, and then yes, they still have the resource of those lecture videos at any time online to go back and watch their teacher reteach that information. They're getting to hear it multiple times a day, not me. So this picture we see Katie at the front of the classroom demonstrating a kinesthetic lecture or a dance about systems of inequalities. Now, without flipping the classroom, this would have never happened, guarantee you. Any algebra teacher, uh, you know, say, oh, here, here's a song about systems of inequalities, here's a dance, here's something you can do. No, not a chance. There's just no time for things like this. But now she can meet the needs of her diverse learners, adding kinesthetics, kinesthetic learning to the classroom, adding music and collaboration. This is true art. She has truly become an artist that inspires her students to then create their own dances, to create their own kinesthetic learning to a song about systems of inequalities. Katie, and I want to give Katie a hand for truly being what I believe the future of education, I think. Yes. So what we're doing at the Friday Institute is to try, try to scale Katie, uh, to try to publish uh, or create and publish resources that use simple one-take video, simple technology to make this happen to use this simple one-take video to remove the lecture from the classroom, help teachers differentiate their instruction, and also meet the needs of students with different learning styles in our very, very diverse classrooms. We have teachers from second grade all the way to grad school, and we're starting to work with undergrads in our College of Education here at North Carolina State University to become artists across different content areas. You look at your content, you process that through your creative lens, and you generate your artifacts of your learning. You generate your art. The key to better education is to have teachers who are more efficient and effective. Quite frankly, we need more teachers like Katie Ginbar. In order to get more Katie's, teachers need to go through the transformation that she went through. Katie, do you feel like every teacher should flip their classroom? Yes, absolutely I do. So we need your help to spread the message. Talk with classroom teachers about flipping the classroom. Encourage them to start this transformation tomorrow using the FIS method with simple one-take videos. Tell them life is too short. Stop repeating yourself. Flip, Flip your, your classroom. classroom. Thank, Thank you. you.